Aloha, I'm Emmy Tumimbang. I'm Larry Ordonez. A hundred years ago, the first Filipino plantation workers, or Sakata, sailed into Honolulu Harbor. Thus began the story of Hawaii's 200,000 strong Filipino community. As part of the celebration of the Filipino centennial in Hawaii, we wanted to share with you stories of courage, hope, and dreams. We look at how and why Filipinos came to Hawaii, the struggle, the joy of plantation life, and the roles Filipinos played in the historic events of the 20th century's first 50 years. We hope you will enjoy Mabuhay with Aloha, the Hawaii Filipino experience. Two peoples, two sets of islands, an ocean apart, entwined with ties, the tides of history, the melding of cultures. Mabuhay with Aloha, the Hawaii Filipino experience began 100 years ago. Mabuhay, to live long and well. Mabuhay is a toast and a wish, and the hope that compelled thousands of Filipinos to leave hearth and home in search of a kinder fortune. For most, it would be the first time they would leave for a long journey far away from home. The exodus started on December 20th, 1906, when 15 men cast their lot across the wide Pacific. There, Hawaii and its sugarcane fields beckoned with the promise of plenty for those willing and able to work for it. As for Aloha, it wasn't part of the equation then. The journey from Mabuhay with Aloha would take time, much more time than the first 15 Filipino sakata, which means migrant worker, could ever anticipate. My father, um, whose name is Venancio, came from Bacara y Lucas Norte in 1946 on a contract. He signed the paper one day and he says, I'm leaving and I'm coming to Hawaii. With it, he brought a lot of hopes and dreams. We got on uh, SS Mauna Wili. It made three or four trips to bring us here. Later on, we found out that that boat was the same boat that they used to uh, ship the cattle from between the islands. So I told no wonder it smelled, it smelled like cow. <laughs> you know, I remember my dad, you know, during that time, uh, when a lot, of, a lot of our neighbors are coming over to Hawaii and says, wow, my dad used to say, I wish I could be one of them. Uh, to be able to go to Hawaii, and our life would be much better than we have now. But soon enough, uh, within a year after that, he got petitioned by my uncle and say, within a year he came to Hawaii. My grandfather came to Hawaii, like many other Filipinos, to work uh, on the plantations. And my father grew up uh, at first on a plantation camp, later on joined the military to see the world. My mom is from Manila, and my father is from Pangasinan. He was actually from Aguilar, um, his province. It's Buk, Buk Aguilar, Pangasinan. So they basically up and left everything they knew over there to start a new life, to basically search for a better life for our family here in Hawaii, um, and in America, namely. Today, Filipinos and part Filipinos comprise 25% of Hawaii's population, the third largest ethnic group in the state, and the fastest growing Asian group in America. More Filipinos immigrate every year, making their country the third largest exporter of new residents to the United States. Why do Filipinos continue to come to America? For a better life, certainly, but the answer also lies in history. like Hawaii is tropical, although quite a bit warmer as it is closer to the equator. Like Hawaii, the land grows sugar, along with rice, coconuts, and dozens of varieties of fruits. The country is much larger than Hawaii, with a land area of more than 115,000 square miles strung along the southeast edge of Asia. It is comprised of 5,000 miles of coastline, 7,000 islands, with 87 languages and dialects. Its three main island groups are Luzon in the north, Visayas in the middle, and Mindanao at the south. At its center is a sprawling capital city of Manila. Hawaii and the Philippines both came under U.S. rule within months of each other in 1898. 
At the time, America was expanding. It launched its first land war in Asia, in the Philippines. American authorities promised to help Filipino rebels fighting to throw off the shackles of 300 years of Spanish rule. But when the Spanish-American War ended in 1898, it was the stars and stripes that flew over the Philippines. The Treaty of Paris ceded the Philippines from Spain to the United States, uh, which was then becoming uh, a power in the Pacific, for $20 million. The Filipinos continued fighting a bloody battle against the new colonial regime, but America had stronger firepower, and after three years, resistance remained only in the Muslim regions of southern Philippines. Halfway across the Pacific, America had acquired another territory. To acquire economic benefits, a small but powerful group of Hawaii businessmen asked for Hawaii's annexation after the overthrow of the monarchy. Annexation would have other benefits as well. That's what the sugar planters thought when they sent their lawyer, Albert F. Judd, to the Philippines. Judd traveled to Manila, bustling with former American soldiers and businessmen. His mission? To sign up 300 Filipino workers. But after six months of bucking bureaucracy and general resistance to labor exportation, he'd fallen far short of his goal. Only 15 men signed up. They boarded the SS Doric in November 1906. The ship weathered the 6,000-mile journey, which took them to China, Japan, and after a month at sea, it sailed safely into Honolulu Harbor. According to a story in the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, the newcomers are all small men, smaller than the Japanese who come here, but they're an intelligent-looking lot. One of them carried a fighting cock under his arm. And where are you from in the Philippines? I am from Cebu, sir. Cebu. I was a farmer in the Philippines. A farmer? Yes, sir. Mm. The first 15 Sakata entered their names in the books of Ola'a Plantation, south of Hilo on the Big Island, and thus began the story of the Filipinos of Hawaii. Sugar was king, as they said. Okay, the sugar was uh, uh, a very big industry. So uh, the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association needed uh, labor. Well, it was the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association which were the owners of the operations, the sugar operations. They were the people that conscripted the labor, they handled the contracts, they, they paid them. So they started out with the Chinese, then the Japanese came, uh, the Koreans, and the, the Filipinos were the last to come as a group. The Hawaii Sugar Planters Association were forced to go to the Philippines because immigration laws in the U.S. had become restrictive again towards Asian immigrants. By 1882-1883, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. By 1904-1905, the, uh, the Gentlemen's Agreement severely limited immigration to the U.S. from Japan. And because Korea was actually a colony of Japan by then, that also affected Koreans. On top of that, you had uh, as a result of the 1900 uh, Organic Act, which brought in American labor laws. That encouraged uh, plantation workers to begin to uh, organize and strike for better wages. From 1900 to 1905, 34 strikes stopped work in the plantations. That sort of worked together to uh, put pressure on the HSBA to look elsewhere. So they went to the Philippines, which was a, uh, by 1906, a uh, U.S. colony. And as a U.S. territory, it meant that they didn't have to be affected by U.S. immigration laws. Sugar brought Hawaii to America, and it was sugar that brought the Philippines to Hawaii. Convincing the Filipinos to leave home to work overseas wasn't an easy task at first. In 1907, only 150 men were found willing. 
But when the Japanese laborers in Hawaii struck again in 1909, the HSPA launched a full-scale propaganda campaign. Filipino officials discouraged the recruitment effort with their own propaganda, supported by the local newspapers. One side shows the, the eager um, Cebuanos who are embarking and are getting on the boat and with happy faces and very healthy bodies and uh, saying, oh, we're going to get rich and we'll, we'll come back as soon as uh, we get our money and uh, have a better life here. Now, the other half of the cartoon shows the same people coming down the boat, meaning returning home, very much emaciated, and saying it was hell over there. And one of the reasons why uh, our, let's say, uh, politicians here, our statesmen, were against this uh, going, going away of these plantation workers is that we also needed labor here. We had our own uh, sugar plantations in central Luzon, as well as in the neighboring uh, Negros. The Visayan Islands in the middle of the Philippine archipelago proved to be fertile recruitment grounds. From 1909 to 1911, more than 4,500 Visayans embarked for Hawaii. The planters decided to expand. They set their sights on other areas in which they had recruitment rights, a narrow strip of land in northern Luzon, the Ilocos. I think it began to um, accelerate after 1910. 1920s definitely was the, uh, the high point because that's when most of the Ilocanos came. The sugar planters promised passage home at the end of a three-year contract. They gave instructions on how to act on board and in the fields. Many a young man was enticed. Others signed up. Some stowed away. Some took the place of others who changed their minds. Among them, former Governor Ben Caetano's father, Bonifacio. He came to Hawaii in 1928, along with a boatload, five, six hundred Filipino uh, laborers from uh, uh, Pangasinan, and to work on the, uh, you know, on the sugar uh, uh, cane fields. And but he came here illegally because he uh, he wasn't on the list. He was a little young. And his 17-year-old cousin decided the very last minute that he didn't want to go. So my father took his place and took the name Caetano. Some women, like Carol Brown's mother, Catalina, then 16, were just as adventurous. My mother came in September 1921 from Oslo, Cebu. And um, no one knew that she was leaving the barrio. She literally ran away. And when uh, her parents caught up with her at the ship, they wanted her to come off, and she refused. Plantation recruiters applied a rough hand policy when deciding who to take aboard ship. They wanted people who were ready for the hard labor conditions that awaited them in Hawaii. Gregorio Orok, 102 years old and one of the oldest living Sakata, came to Hawaii in 1926 from Cebu and worked on Kauai. His daughter explains her father's early recruitment experience. For them to be chosen, they, they had to be um, hard-working people, so, and he used to get his hands all gnarled so he would look like he's a hard-working person <laughs> because he was young, he was only 19. I think the idea was to um, some kind of an American dream uh, that stayed. So come to Hawaii and you can make uh, uh, your riches there. And uh, so that, that, that had the effect of making many of the Sakadas uh, from the locals to uh, uh, mortgage their properties and borrow from their families for the passage to Hawaii. By the 1930s, two-thirds of Hawaii's plantation laborers were Filipinos. The money they sent home along with glowing, often exaggerated letters, the visits home by Hawaiianos dressed to the nines in their Americano suits despite blistering heat. These proved more enticing than any spiel by a professional recruiter. Some of them actually did come home with gold in their pockets. Others signed another contract to earn more. Jose Ramos put his handprint on the contract twice. His son, Angel, tells the story. 
my father tell, oh, you know, when I was in Hawaii, I didn't spend anything foolishly. Every penny count. And that's how he had our, uh, my two older sister go to college, be, build house and buy land for us. Later, Angel himself was bound for Hawaii at the urging of his parents. So while I was going to school, my parents had my papers uh, documented at the municipal office. And the next weekend, I tell them, I'm going to Hawaii. The year was 1946. It would be the last time the sugar planters would be able to bring a large group of cicada to the islands. It wasn't hard for the HSPA to find 6,000 workers, plus more than 1,300 women and children, to sign up for Hawaii. The sugar planters had asked their workers to invite their relatives, and life at home looked bleak. World War II had devastated the Philippines. After the war, on July 4th, 1946, the United States was going to grant the national independence of the Philippines. So in the spring of 1946, the Planters Association from Hawaii saw that opportunity to go recruit for one last chance without any diplomatic legal you know, red tape. The 1946 Sakata sailed in five voyages from the small fishing port of Salomage on the ships SS Mauna Willi and the SS Marine Falcon. Many of them stayed. As more and more of them became citizens and voted, the plantations held tremendous power, but the Filipinos became a separate force on their own. And, and that's why they were so important. They could swing the balance of power. For 40 years, 1906 to 1946, 126,000 Filipinos came to Hawaii through the HSPA. Hundreds more arrived on their own in search of a better life. Hawaii, just like heaven is Hawaii. Our friends coming home would bring back so many things, so many stories. We couldn't help but dream of Hawaii in the barrio. So I came here full of dreams. But conditions in the cane fields could hardly be construed as heaven. Oi, trabaho na tayo. I want such a doubt. They got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. They were supposed to be in the fields by 6. Uh, they worked a 10-hour day, 6 days a week. Uh, they got paid a dollar a day, or they were $6 a week. Uh, it, Ten cents an hour would be another way to look at that. And uh, then they came home after a long day's work, worth of work, not to a family, but uh, to a barracks. The plantation furnished the workers with basic needs. A blanket, shoes, denim pants, a long-sleeved khaki shirt to protect against the sun and the sharp edges of the sugar cane, one hoe and blade per weeder, a long knife to cut cane, and a bongo, metal ID with number for each employee. Trains transported laborers from the plantation camps to the cane fields. They were good workers. In those days, you know, worker was a cane knife, a hole, and a shovel. And they needed those kinds of workers. The cicada were dispersed on all islands, assigned to whichever plantation needed help at the time. Through the years, plantations merged and came under the control of Hawaii's big five companies. Well, let's start with the Big Island, which was mostly a brewer stronghold. And the rest of the plantations were made up of Davies plantations. Ola in the old days was an Amphac plantation, and the only one. And then the only other plantation was owned by Castle Cook, which was Kohala. Kauai was predominantly American factors. Maui was controlled by Alexander and Baldwin. In addition, Seabruin Company had Wailuku Sugar Company. Amphac had Pioneer Mill Company that my great-grandfather started from scratch. And the biggest plantations in those days were Wau Sugar Company and Eva Plantation. And eventually, Wau Sugar 
merged with Eva and became one. So it was a huge plantation. They were societies all onto their own, unlike what you would find in any place else. As the newest group in the field, Filipinos were paid less for the same work and were housed in poorer living conditions than other ethnic groups. They say that they could have a beautiful place to sleep, a whole house, and a good place to, you know, for eat, but they all piled up like sardines in one, one room. Many plantations separated racial groups into different camps because they feared ethnic strife. That's the reason that each plantation had a separate camp for each type of people. They put them all in one camp. It'd be war. The Japanese killed the Chinese at Kuku. They hated them with a passion. Why? The Chinese were up the ladder and the Japanese were, you know, down. When the Filipinos came, what? They were farther, they were the lowest of the low. The HSPA preferred unmarried, less educated workers who would be less likely to look for other employment. They had to be single. So it was, it was discouraged for them to bring um, their wives, if, if any, so. Uh, and, and also, they had to be not well schooled. Work and living conditions varied from place to place, but there were reports of harsh treatment by Lunas, lack of medical care, and unequal pay. Some of the workers were being mistreated by their Lunas, you know, the supervisors. The story my father says, and that's why he got thrown off one of the plantations, was that one of the Lunas were waking up the workers in their dormitory-like setting with a whip. And my father got very angry and had a physical fight with that Luna. Pablo Manlapet came to Hawaii in 1910 as a cicada. He didn't last long in the field. Deploring the conditions he found at a Hilo plantation, Manlapet urged Filipinos to fight for better conditions. In 1920, Japanese laborers joined the members of Manlapet's union in a 165-day strike at four plantations on Oahu. 12,000 workers were evicted from plantation houses until tired and needing their wages, however meager to survive, the workers went back to work with nothing to show for their hardship. When Lapid continued to agitate, traveling from plantation to plantation, thousands followed him during a 1924 strike that lasted eight months. The reason they went on strike is they were being paid a dollar a day. And they were trying to get two dollars a day. So they were thinking, if we can get two dollars a day, we'll save money faster and we can go home sooner. Instead, the strike ultimately produced 20 dead men. This was the bloodiest incident in Hawaii's labor history. On September 8th, the day before the, the, the massacre, two Ilocanos from uh, Makaweli Plantation uh, took their bicycles to Hanapepe to buy a pair of shoes. And uh, they were basically waylaid by the uh, Visayans. They grabbed them, took them into the headquarters there where they were beaten, and apparently not beaten very badly, but certainly scared, and apparently in an effort to get them and others to join the, the strike. The police, the sheriff, got an order to go and get them and then bring them out. Um, my understanding is that he successfully had custody of the two and were leading them back towards uh, the cars that were parked along the side of the road in Hanapepe and exactly who fired the first shot, who did what, uh, is not clear. Gregorio Orok knew some of the men. They were his kababayan, townmates from Cebu. He grew up Ruth Seto is pointing to the area where her old Japanese school once stood. It had also served as the headquarters for the striking Filipino workers. So as we walked home from school, we heard the gunshots. Saw the Filipinos running into the bulrushes along the river. They were trying to hide out from all the shooting. 
All I remember is that there was a lot of uh, crying, you know, uh, my mother folks, and, and worrying about themselves because uh, that had happened. What happened to the 16 men who were shot, uh, really nobody knows. We just know that they were uh, all buried together, dumped in a uh, common grave site. What I remember is um, ha having known the, the widows and, and widows marrying for the second time, you know, uh, with children. So there were many stepchildren. The Hanapepe Massacre is variously called the Hanapepe Riot, the Hanapepe Battle, or the Battle of Hanapepe, and the Hanapepe Massacre. And it depends on whose side you're, you're talking. The police talk about it as a riot. All of the, the Filipinos who were um, tried for what happened that day and were found guilty and sentenced to four years in jail uh, were sentenced for riot. In the short term, I don't think the massacre had a great deal of impact. Ten years later, uh, the minimum wage was still a dollar a day, ten hours a day, six days a week. So things hadn't changed as far as that was concerned. A 1937 strike by thousands of Filipino workers in Pu'unene on Maui resulted in major benefits, but the organizers were arrested and Pablo Manlapet was deported from Hawaii permanently. Abelina Madrid Shaw, daughter of a cicada, talks about the significance of the early labor movement. It was an opportunity and a show of force that, hey, we have rights to, we can speak and we can speak as one voice. And I think that was the message that was sent. And then we weren't going to just kind of mock it, die, did. These people should be remembered for having been in a situation or having had the guts to stand up for what they believed in, for a better way of life. And if we can each in our own way, whenever we encounter a situation, stand up for the right thing, for the better thing to do, for things that would make uh, people's life better, then that's the way we should use what happened to them. Violence did not stop plantation workers from striking for better conditions. Work stoppages caused the planters enough grief and money that the HSPA was forced to negotiate. Little by little, plantation conditions improved. Jay Sasan's father was a cicada in the 1920s. They started off probably uh, doing uh, hohana work, you know, weeding, and then he uh, progressed on to become uh, a seed cutter because the money was there, even though they had to work real hard, but they were able to make uh, better wages. My dad, when he started cutting cane and uh, in, in the 20, uh, 1924 and 25, he became a good seed cutter. He was able to make uh, 10 or up to $20 a day on contract. That enabled Jay to complete a degree in agriculture at the University of Hawaii and become the first sugar plantation manager of Filipino ancestry. Workers and their families lived in camps named after the different groups who lived in them. The houses were simple wooden structures provided by the plantation, almost rent-free. We were very closely knit. The other families were very nice. I thought we were lucky because my mother was very, very resourceful. She would do things for the men who didn't have their families here, either sew for them, wash their clothes for them, or embroider things that uh, they would like to use for decorating their rooms. And what I would do after school, I would go from house to house and get their names and ask them if they want hot meal when they come home, and my mother would cook and I would go and deliver. It was a place of security. You know, you could rely on the family doctor. The family doctor was always there. My mother was recruited with other nurses from the Philippines because the medical community realized they weren't getting to the Filipino workers. They were throwing away their medications. And they got smart enough and recruited nurses uh, to do this kind of interpreting and helping. The camp was really the center of activity 
in the 50s where during the night we would have an area in the camp where the community would meet after dinner and we would be discussing uh, the uh, uh, thoughts of the day and, and, and current events. Weddings would be done in a camp. Put up a, put up a tent and then they would have a band, Filipino band, Rondalia, and cooking would be done in a backyard. The Filipinos contributed their, their own happy-go-lucky style, uh, the music and the partying and all that uh, added to the culture of, the, of Hawaii. Some men would uh, form a group like we have today, organization, a club, and some were very good at playing music. So they would schedule an event and we would go to the clubhouse. And the men would be asking the women to bring food stuff in a box and they would auction the box. They used to call it social box. The winner of the auction would share the meal with the young woman and perhaps even have the first and last dance with her. The plantation provided ballparks for baseball and special events. It also sponsored parades and celebrations during holidays like Rizal Day, honoring the national hero of the Philippines. In this way, the connections to the old country remain strong. Filipino associations sprung up all over the islands based on hometown affiliations. We also had, uh, as part of our program, we had a dance group and we also have a learning or a school. So we can teach some of our uh, brothers how to read, at least sign their paycheck. The work was hard, money was scarce, accommodations were basic, but life, especially on the plantations, was good enough to support a family for many people. We have 13 uh, plantation babies. They were all born and raised in Kahuku. Um, raising them was not hard. We, we didn't feel any burden at all. Housing was cheap. We paid only $27.50. Uh, rent, water, one dollar, electricity. At one point, the plantation owned the electric system, only a dollar. And I paid only six dollars and eighty cents for my medical plan. With plantation life becoming secure and a second generation planting roots in Hawaii, Filipinos were slowly but surely moving from Mabuhay to Aloha. Not everyone wanted the life the plantations offered. Filipinos moved from one plantation to another or escaped to the cities to find work in canning and packing companies, lumber yards, and at the docks. By the 1930s, some Filipinos were in business. My father was Vicente Akuhito. He, was, uh, he came to Hawaii in 1926 as a Sakata, plantation Sakata assigned to Maui. And when he finished his uh, year's contract, he moved to Honolulu and decided that uh, perhaps he should move to Wahewa, where he could work uh, at his trade, being a shoe repairman. His main clients were soldiers from Schofield Barracks, where some Filipino scouts were enlisted in the U.S. Army. My father, Eugenio Dagio, was uh, recruited into the American Army in about 1926 as a scout. I was uh, treated as like, what place, what, what uh, plantation you from? I says, not me. My father was a soldier. No, I can't be. He had to work in the plantation, pineapple or sugarcane. I said, my dad wore a uniform every day, and when he went to work, he had a trumpet. Similar to the plantation, Schofield had its own Filipino camp, Kastner Village. They were segregated into their own Kessna village area, aside from the other military families. And also, you know, they were regulated to these jobs as cooks, musicians, and, and uh, stewards. And that, that was a classical assignment for Filipino nationals. I defined soldier Sakata because the word Sakata meant 
Are laborers working at a lesser rate than the locals and also suffering some discrimination? And they held low ranks until maybe 25 years, 20 to 25 years before they made sergeant. But at the end of the career, most of them ended up as senior non-commissioned officers. In Hilo on the Big Island, Carol Brown talks about her parents' business ventures. My father didn't stay on the plantation very long because they wanted him to be a Luna. However, he told them that he was a gambler. And um, I guess he, he was very good in playing cards and he wanted to open a pool hall. They lived above the pool hall. And later on during the war years, my father expanded. Uh, he had this uh, meat market called Ideal Meat Market and he started opening up other pool halls. And he had a barber shop that was very close to Mama Theater. And by 1960, he had a bachelor's rooming house. My mother, too, was a businesswoman because she would prepare food and sell whatever she did at the chicken fights. In fact, Carol's parents met at the chicken fights where the workers could win or lose the equivalent of many months' wages. They could also gamble in the pool halls, which filled up with single men dressed to the hilt for a weekend in town. You would never see them in their work clothes, always well-dressed and, you know, having nice shine shoes. After Pauhana and take a shower, they head out to the dancing places called taxi dance halls in those days. And they were over here in Ala Park, in Hilo, in Lihui, you know, wherever, throughout the islands, and went dancing. The male-female ratio was woefully skewed. In 1920, there were 30 Filipino men to one woman. As late as 1950, the U.S. Census counted 628 men to every 100 women in Hawaii's foreign-born Filipino population. Life was lonely. For many, it wasn't easy to save up enough money to come home a hero. Ever since I left our hometown and I came to this far distant land of Hawaii, I have been thinking about you. I left Pidig in 1915 when I was a mere boy. So I've been here about 18 years now and I have this feeling of sadness. I feel like coming home. I wonder how I can get over this feeling of loneliness. Maybe you can help me. For some, life was also shiftless and sometimes violent. They were mostly single uh, males without their families, which was um, uh, a disaster. There weren't many Filipino women. Any woman was prized, even the child. Uh, it was very much wanted as a wife. So my classmates got married after graduation, eighth grade, to whoever maybe had most, the most money. Some of them um, decided they didn't want to get married, would run away. Guillermo Jacinto went back to the Philippines to find a wife. Juana Jacinto considered his proposal because she was over the usual marrying age. I like to come to Hawaii, but then I'm still scared. So I wrote him that if he will come to the Philippines and meet me, and we see each other, we will see how we feel. Filipinos face prejudice when paying court to women of other ethnic groups. It's part of the family lore that uh, my Japanese side of the family would never speak to my mother's side of the family because my aunt had married a Filipino. And uh, several years later, my mom turned around and also married a Filipino man. Our status in, in Hawaii since then was very much determined by how the outsiders looked at Filipinos and the Filipino camp, you know? From the viewpoint of the world outside, we were kind of like a dark-skinned people, spoke strange language, had strange ways, ate 
paria and cooked baboy over open fire. Um, we were totally preoccupied with cockfighting. And then we were, in fact, the bottom of the social ladder. That's how the community viewed us. Within the Filipino community itself, unity was an elusive goal because of regional differences between the Tagalog, Visayan, and Ilocano immigrants. In 1932, as a result of the Great Depression, plantations sent 7,300 cicada back to the Philippines, and the planters stopped recruiting altogether in 1933. And then, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. West Coast Filipinos, many of them migrant field workers, clamored to fight to defend their country from the Japanese onslaught. These workers, uh, they were mostly in very uh, domestic jobs, low-paying jobs, prejudiced against. But December 7th, they said, we want to do something. So. Some of the leaders of the Filipino community in the mainland came together and they, they pressured President Roosevelt to urge that he would uh, write an executive order so that they could join. And with that executive order, 7,000 Filipinos from throughout the whole mainland and Alaska showed up. I was a teenager then, uh, in the war, and uh, when my brother was drafted, I went in. Uh, and when I went in, I joined about 300 young Filipino boys, all plantation people, in Schofield. The 1st and 2nd Filipino Infantry Regiments stormed a prison camp to free American soldiers detained during the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. They joined intelligence units and helped liberate the Philippines from Japan. It really was an act of heroism. Now, the importance of the work they did in war was that, one, it changed the attitude of the Americans towards the Filipinos. But these boys showed the medal of the bravery of the Filipinos and that they could be good soldiers. During World War II, 200,000 Filipinos, based both in the United States and in the Philippines, fought side by side with Americans in the Pacific. Today, they're fighting for equal veteran status, successfully lobbying Congress for citizenship, health, and pension rights, the fulfillment of promises made long ago in exchange for loyalty and bravery in the line of fire. Before World War II, it could be said that Filipinos had one foot lodged in the old hometown, the other poised tentatively over their adopted country. For those who came and stayed, dreams did come true through sheer will, determination, and persistence. Filipinos started to gain leadership positions by working with other races, especially through the unions like the ILWU. In 1946, uh, the workers organized the international Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, or ILW, uh, which brought together different ethnic groups into one single union. The slogan was, an injury to one is an injury to all. The plantations thought they could break looming strikes with fresh recruits from the Philippines. But instead of scabs, the 1946 Sakata became union stalwarts, and the Filipinos remained the backbone and the strength of the unions up to today. By the 1950s, Hawaii's plantation economy could not function without the Filipino worker. Former sugar plantation manager Fred Trotter remembers that Filipinos backed him in a dispute on a Kauai plantation in Ele Ele. Trotter had just been fired. Miles away. So I went in my office, I gathered up my stuff, and I started to walk out the door. I couldn't get out the back door because there were about 500, mostly Filipinos, standing there with their cacao tins and, and hoes. They shut the plantation down, that's it. The mill screeched to a halt. And it was apparent to me that these guys were hard workers, very loyal. 
To celebrate the Filipino centennial in Hawaii, Big Island artist and professor Fred Soriano carved a statue to honor the Sakata legacy. It now stands in Keaau, formerly known as Ola'a, where the first 15 Sakata were assigned to work. As I do the piece, the Sakatas unfold before my eyes. The uh, uh, Gorios, the Karyas, the uh, uh, Tata Domingos. With my bare hands, I help build Hawaii. I plowed the lands for the cane fields with mules. I cut cane, I have paiko, carried cane, and watered sugar cane. That's how life was. They would sacrifice, they would give up, you know, their homeland, they would sacrifice their health and their life so that we could enjoy, you know, kind of life we, we live today. It's an obligation you have to realize their dreams. It's not your dreams here, it's their dreams. The decision they made a long time ago to come to Hawaii was a good decision, not a bad decision. This is the story of the Sakata. Their tales and those of their children and grandchildren have intermingled with Hawaii's, so it is hard to tell where one begins and the other ends. Statehood, it was the beginning of a new age. In 1959, the year Hawaii became the 50th state, Pan American Airways flew its first jet load of tourists to Hawaii. In the next decades, the plantation economy would be eclipsed by other forces. Tourism, construction, the military presence. Hawaii was changing, and so was its Filipino community. Those who retired and left the plantations for Honolulu city life gathered and lived in downtown places like Aala Park. Keeping ties to their hometowns and provinces, one group of Filipinos who wanted to have a meeting place or social hall of their own built the Visayan Hinabangai Clubhouse in Waipahu in the mid-50s. But the main purpose at the time was to help each other, especially during uh, when someone passed away and whatnot, they asked for donations. It started that way. Then they, they met in various places and then they finally decided, let's, let's build a clubhouse. And when they built this clubhouse, they started with only $23 donation from each member. Today, both second and third generation families continue to celebrate special Filipino holidays and keep traditional events going. On the airwaves, Filipino broadcasters like Leonora Albayalde, Faustino Respicio, and Tommy Tamimbang entertain their audiences with nostalgic music and talent shows. My grandfather is Tommy Tamimbang. He arrived here from Sikihor in 1931. Uh, he was a pioneer in, in terms of uh, Filipino in radio uh, as well as in TV. Uh, I know that some of his work uh, encompassed um, really presenting um, to the community or representing community uh, in, the wor in the work that he did in terms of beauty contests and songbird contests. 24 hours and service to Sakadadlao. Alvin's Drive-In, 8 7 1978 he wanted to present um, a different side of the Filipino, and he wanted to also to share with the plantation workers um, a different way of maybe relaxing or, or a way of entertainment, uh, perhaps, uh, and to give them some reprieve from the toil and hard work. In the 50s, many Filipinos were listening to Kahu Radio, the home of many Sunday morning Filipino radio programs with live entertainment. On Maui, A.B. Sevilla, a prominent businessman and civic leader, was also pioneering Filipino community events on the Valley Isle with his own radio show. He was a radio announcer and um, the beginnings of uh, non-American, uh, non-English speaking. He was the first um, in 1946, I believe, he started that here on Maui and went on till 1977 when he retired from the radio station. Before he passed away, I remember reading uh, one of the resolutions to him and I said, my goodness, Dad, I didn't realize you did so much to promote 
you know, who we were as Filipinos, and your being so active in such a, um, he was very altruistic, really, uh, but he did a lot, and I think it was the beginnings of saying, okay, if I can do it, you can do it also. Mabuhay, and welcome to Filipino Fiesta, now in its 29th successful year. The longest a popular Filipino variety television show was Filipino Fiesta, hosted by Faustino Respicio, which lasted over three decades. Uh, Filipino Fiesta, when I watch it, it's not only to sh tell me how good the Filipinos are talented in their music, in their dances. However, it's really an avenue to some other people as an opening for their success. It's an early version of Filipino American Idol. Filipino Fiesta ended in 1986. Today, both Larry Ordinez and Ernie Bautista, who worked with Respicio, carry on Respicio's legacy on their Filipino radio programs. And by good friends, On the Pali Highway, the Philippine Consulate, acquired by the Philippine government in 1957 through the efforts of Consul General Juan C. Donicio, became a center for Filipinos to gather and meet with local, national, and international dignitaries. The Consul General had a vision to unite and give a voice to the Filipino community. He had a goal was to visit every plantation and uh, stand there at 5 o'clock in the morning um, to greet them as they boarded the buses and trucks, to go to the field, shake hands, and uh, tell them to organize. And uh, we organized about 30 or 40 uh, associations. The result was the establishment of the first statewide Filipino organization, the United Filipino Council of Hawaii and its island councils. With Hawaii's economy growing, business leaders inaugurated the Filipino Chamber of Commerce in the early 50s, led by real estate investor Pastor Pablo. His son Chris later also headed the chamber. I think a group of them got together and said, you know, I think it's time that we form uh, an organization to help other Filipino businesses to improve our lot, improve our reputation in the community, uh, not only in service to the Filipino community, but in joining the mainstream. Filipinos began collecting a string of firsts, especially in government. The first representative in territorial government, Peter Aduha. The first state senator, future state Supreme Court Justice, Benjamin Menor. The first city cabinet member, Geminiano Toy Are. The first county supervisor, Richard Caldito. Richard Caldito Sr. was the pioneer of opening the gates for Filipinos to be included in being selected and appointed in boards and commissions here in the county of Maui. I think it kind of signaled the recognition that government and um, the rest of the community, that the Filipinos are up and coming. It was a recognition that we could contribute more to the economy of the state. Kauai's Eduardo Malapit remembers how it was to be a pioneer in politics in the 70s. He is the country's first Filipino-American mayor. It was hard because Plantations were Republicans. Then the Japanese took over the legislature and the political structure, the Democrats were all Japanese. When I ran for political office for the council, I had my friends and my family and my classmates. Then I won. Even before politics, Malapit had other firsts. He was the first Filipino football player at the University of Hawaii and went on to attend and play football at Notre Dame. Politics, however, was where he feels he made his mark. I gave politics a good Filipino beginning. It let guys like Ben Caetano become governor. I just want to be remembered as a mayor who did good and that I am Filipino. In 1965, the face of the Hawaii Filipino changed again. In 1965, Congress uh, passed a big immigration reform, and that's when uh, Filipinos could bring in their families. The U.S. liberalized uh, the immigration law 
to allow uh, all kinds of professionals to come in. Since then, an average of 3,500 to 4,000 new immigrants enter Hawaii every year, making Filipinos the fastest growing ethnic group in the islands. Today, 40% of Hawaii's Filipinos were born in the Philippines. Like many new immigrants, they often start at the bottom of the economic and social ladder. Even highly educated lawyers, like retired Maui judge Artemio Baxa. I thought that with my professional background, I would be able to get uh, an appropriate job in accordance with my training. I tried to do the best I can, but I could not. I work as a bellhop at the old Wailuku Hotel. Those who joined family members were usually from rural provinces where the Sakata originated. Early immigrant experiences were challenging and oftentimes confusing. I call it fresh off the boat. I came here through a boat instead of an airplane, coming from a home province of uh, an area where there's no electricity and no water, running water and no TV. It was more of us against the local Filipinos because they didn't want to have anything to do with us. One, we dressed funny. Uh, we dressed differently than they did. Number two, we looked funny and definitely uh, the language barrier, we, you know, our, we can't speak English. We had a very heavy accent and they didn't like that. Uh, what was happening in the, by the 1970s was a ballooning of uh, immigrant students in the public education system. Not only Filipinos, but other, other groups too. So what happened was that the uh, Department of Education was overburdened by uh, students who could not speak English. There were lots of gang fights in the public schools and also a lot of our Filipino immigrant children uh, weren't doing well in school. And that's when we started Operation Manong. It was just a simple idea, let's go and tutor them in the public schools. Oftentimes the, the, the public schools would say that the Filipino immigrant had to acculturate, which is true, but we also had to tell everyone that the Hawaii people had to learn about the culture and history of the new immigrants. Operation Manong allowed that to happen. Local Filipino students mentored immigrant newcomers, and the exchange proved positive for both sides. Today, the Immigrant Project has a new name, SEED, Student Excellence, Equity and Diversity through the University of Hawaii, and has expanded its work to other Asian and Polynesian immigrant groups. It was the activist era. Groups began looking for ways to find solutions to the problems faced by both local and immigrant Filipinos. They protested evictions in Honolulu's Chinatown and at Ota Camp in Waipahu. In the 70s, Ota Camp was near the St. Joseph Church in Waipahu. 32 families were told they were going to be evicted for a new development project. They opposed the move, protested, and took on the city council and the mayor. Eventually, they won, and so the city, uh, I think it was the city or the state, offered them land to purchase at uh, Westlock, and that's where they're located right now. Ota Camp was kind of a turning point on Filipinos uh, becoming empowered. Today, Labarios is also looking at statistics of the men who were executed in Hawaii's prisons. We're looking at the, from the 1900s on, and we noticed that 80% uh, of those that were executed were Filipinos. The majority of them were plantation workers, were single, and, uh, and you know, there's just this clash of cultures that are occurring, and nobody was able to represent their point of view. When you look at uh, the executions, the juries, None of the juries contained uh, had any Filipinos. Libarius and Kimoto hope to eliminate future racial profiling of Filipinos and other minority groups. <laughs> Among Hawaii's Filipinos, regional hostilities flared when former Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos was ousted from power and exiled in Hawaii, deeply dividing the community. Many Hawaii Filipinos supported him and his wife Imelda, Marcos died here in 1989. The late President Marcos came to Hawaii. It seems like it's a good, when he was exiled here, it seems like it was a perfect place for the family of the Marcoses because the majority of Filipinos here are Ilocanos, where most of them speak his own dialect and most of them came from the same area. But to his surprise, we 
and to the surprise of Filipino also in Hawaii, especially the local people, they found out that there are some anti-Marcuses also here in Hawaii. And it was a big problem because even their own families are being divided. That was then, today is different. It is time to move on and build a better future for our young people in Hawaii. Building a better life is the dream of all immigrants and the challenge. As with native Hawaiians and Micronesians, high percentages of Filipinos are found in lower paying service occupations. With parents working two or three jobs to make ends meet, children fall through the cracks or drift into crime and drugs. Between 1998 and 2000, five of the seven domestic violence-related homicides we could confirm were Filipino women, and that's uh, something like 70% of all the deaths that occurred in that period. And so I think particularly for immigrant women, they have a U.S. citizen batterer, they can continue to hold the threat of deportation over their heads, and so they stay. Today, the Domestic Violence Clearinghouse and Legal Hotline is offering services under their newly formed Filipino Rural Project. The program offers faith-based training counselors and dialect-speaking peers to assist immigrant Filipino women. Labor figures show that a higher than usual percentage of Filipinos, 34 percent, are found in the service sector in hotels, restaurants, and retail stores compared to all other ethnic groups in the state. While Filipinos' per capita income is smaller than the state average, household income is higher and poverty rates are less. The reason? Extended families who help each other and good old-fashioned values, hard work, positive attitude, and persistence. So I worked in Waikiki as a busboy. That is one of the best experiences that I ever had. The best thing I think that I gathered from there is because, one, it kept me away from the usual problems that I would have had if I stayed home. More importantly, I learned how to speak English. Today, Roland Casamina owns his own mortgage company. Lito Alcantara first arrived in Hawaii in 1973 from Ilocos Norte. He found a job as a janitor. He would later climb through the ranks of the company and end up as its vice president. It does not mean that you may be in the lowest position right now. Like you said, it may be a janitor, but don't lose hope, don't lose sight in the future because I am a very good example of that. Alcantara runs his own multi-million dollar construction company, Group Builders, and received the 2006 Outstanding Union Builder Award from the Hawaii Carpenters Association. Instead of just working at hospitals, a group of Filipino doctors will soon own the St. Francis Medical Center. Dr. Danilo Canetti heads the 120 physician owners group, many of whom are Filipino. With doctors now managing the hospital, we can set the bar very high, we will hear each other instead of having to answer to administrators. Filipinos have made names for themselves in all walks of life. The first Miss America of Filipino ancestry is also from Hawaii, Angela Perez Baracchio. And to see that a Filipina can become Miss America years later, come on, that is something to celebrate. And it's not, again, it's not about me, it's about the fact that a Filipina can do this, a Filipino from immigrant parents can make a difference. In sports, athletes like boxers Ben Villaflor and Brian Valoria and baseball left fielder Benny Agbayani are sources of pride for the community. In Hollywood, island talents like Tia Carrere and Mark Dacascos are established film actors. And breaking ground on local television newscasts News tonight at 5 o'clock followed by New Center 4 at 5. Island-born Filipino faces showed up for the first time on the nightly news. An array of Filipino musicians became respected and seasoned performers on the local entertainment scene. Beyond Hawaii, young stars like Jasmine Trias have gone mainstream and are making names for themselves in the country of their parents' birth. After going to the Philippines, just to be in touch with 
everybody and just relate to everybody who is Filipino, you know, you really find that connection with who you are. So um, I'm, I'm proud to be Filipino. Today's Filipino entertainment community has deep and unexpected roots in Hawaii's musical history. In 1889, Filipino musician Jose Liborno, originally from Manila, jumped ship from a touring Italian circus group. Within months, he joined and led the Royal Hawaiian Band and arranged music for Queen Liliu Okalani. Among his most memorable works, Kaulana Napua, the protest song which became the anthem of the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. Traditional Filipino music was a major form of entertainment during the plantation days, and mandolin players like Florentino Mamalios are one of a kind. Dancing is in the Filipino blood, and artists kept folk traditions alive on all islands. Many learned about their native culture from troops like the Filipiniana Dance Company, led by Inez Cayaban and Aurelia Viernes. The dancers came from all over. They were children of parents who wanted to perpetuate the art, to keep the traditions, the Filipino tradi traditions, alive. Maria Mendoza continues Filipiniana's work and also includes dance in her classes at Pearl Harbor Kai Elementary. At the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the Pearl of the Orient dance troupe performed for 11 years for Waikiki audiences. The group disbanded years ago and its founder, Pat Valentin, continues to give lessons to senior citizens. I felt through them they will get to their great-grandchildren or great or their grandchildren. Uh, hopefully this is what's going to take place. Utang na loob, which in Tagalog means a debt of gratitude, fuels the Filipinos' belief of giving back. Each year, doctors and nurses join the Aloha Medical Missions to the Philippines to help treat those who cannot afford medical care. The Consuelo Foundation, founded by the late Consuelo Alger, supports programs for children, youth, and women both here and in the Philippines. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, the local Filipino community sent aid to the victims. Every Tuesday evening, the strains of Filipino music wafted through the Filipino Community Center in Waipahu. Formally inaugurated in 2002, the Philcom Center is a tangible symbol of the Filipinos' coming of age, a long-awaited representation of our presence in this state. I would like to see the Philcom Center uh, really serve as a catalyst for further Filipino uh, achievement. The Filipino Community Center offers outreach fairs, classes, and workshops and hosts special events attended by community leaders and members. Philippine President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo paid a visit to congratulate Hawaii Filipinos during their centennial year. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be part of this celebration. She also unveiled the statue of a Sakata, which she brought from the Philippines as a gift to the Philcom Center. On the centennial of Filipino migration to the United States, the unveiling of this beautiful Sakata statue here at the Philippine Community Center, in order of the first Filipino migrant workers in Hawaii 100 years ago, signifies our two countries' recognition of the courage of our forebears in this great land. Today's Filipino Americans also have made their mark in such fields as politics, public service, business, sports, the arts, show business, culinary arts. We have here a prime example, former Hawaii Governor Ben Cayetano, the first state governor of Filipino ancestry in the history of the United States. And we owe it all to those 15 brave men. We should never forget them and their sacrifice. 
As the Filipinos enter their second century in Hawaii, what are their new dreams? Where will the community be in the next 100 years? As the community matures, so will the Filipino identity. Many of us do come from families from these different provinces and regions. However, we identify ourselves primarily as Filipino and not really, oh, I'm from this province and my parents are from here and my parents speak this and my grandparents came from this town. And Silayan was born in the Philippines of Dutch and Filipino heritage. She has been living in Hawaii since she was a very young girl. We're part of a greater population in Hawaii and we can identify ourselves simply as Filipino. I actually moved here from the Philippines. I was born there and I moved here when I was one, so I was basically raised here for 30 years in Hawaii. Growing up in Hawaii, both Silayan Casino and Marlene Baldueza have adapted more to the American culture, but they are also part of a growing group of young Filipino immigrants who are rediscovering their heritage. I feel that the Filipino youth are very united because they're united by their culture, by their their ethnic identity, and that's something that they like to hold on to, and especially they want to learn more about it. Local Filipino publications have always kept the community in touch with news of their homeland. A young progressive group of Maui publishers hope to bridge the past with the present. I think one of our biggest challenges as a community right now for the youth is to bring the stories um, of the older Filipinos back and um, be able to share those stories with one another. It would inspire the younger generation to actually do better than what we already have and what our forefathers have started in the past. Not only is it a source of cultural pride for um, Filipino Americans, young and old, but um, it's also um, a way to um, disseminate information uh, to them. The local, rather than purely Filipino identity, is growing stronger, especially with second and third generation Filipino Americans. I got elected because I was local, and because I was a local boy who happened to be Filipino. And I think that my success in politics, because I was in it for 28 years, one of the things that I, that I found out is that people, no matter what ethnic group they are, if someone doesn't make race an issue, then all they're concerned about is things that are universal to everybody. And it's also certain that Filipinos will meld even more into the rainbow fabric of Hawaii. More and more Filipino interracial marriages will contribute to the cosmopolitan culture of Hawaii. Some will even face newer challenges, as with one Hawaii family whose interracial marriage meant important decisions on both ethnic issues and religious beliefs. Having grown Catholic, and in a predominantly Catholic country, you know, I thought, well, it's just another religion. Looking back, I think it's very important for husband and wife to agree on what kind of religion they will raise their children in. And I don't regret it at all. I um, converted into Islam before we got married. We didn't really have that Filipino upbringing. We had the Filipino festivals, and mom would definitely educate us about her lifestyle and her upbringing, but because we were Muslim, dad's influence took over a lot. As we celebrate 100 years of movements, milestones, change, and challenges, one family epitomizes the evolution of the sugar industry. In the Andrian family, three generations have worked at HCNS, Maui's last surviving sugar plantation. When my dad got here um, in '46, he started working in the uh, in the fields uh, cutting uh, sugar cane. And I guess within a month or so, um, what happened is uh, he applied to uh, work in the uh, in the mill itself as a mud system operator. Roberto Andrian Sr. was one of the last Sakata to leave from Port Salamage in the Philippines back in 1946. My mom used to tell me the story that, yeah, your dad came home, that's the reason why you were born. And uh, now I'm actually looking at the proof that he, he did go home. So it's a wonderful piece of uh, history. Andrian Jr. was born in Ilocos Norte and raised on Maui. He got out of the military in 1982 and became an HCNS machinist. 
He is now the union liaison for the company's employees. His son Christopher is evidence of opportunities evolving in the sugar industry. Our training is, it goes from wiring to an outlet all the way to big transformers messing with 23,000 volts. When HCNS begins producing electricity from renewable sources such as sugarcane waste, Christopher will be there working on the electrical system with a specialty in fiber optics. Not quite the kind of work his grandfather did. Grandpa came from so far away, on a boat, not on a plane, worked so hard. Just <laughs> amazing, you know. It's, and now seeing how hard he worked to come to Hawaii <laughs> gives me a sense of feeling that I'm blessed. Noel Calixto emigrated to Hawaii in the 80s. Today, his children Leah and Josh are going back to their father's home province to manage a 110-acre mango plantation and processing plant. He wants us to actually have hands-on experience in the office and to know the workers and to know the people helping us build this corporation and come to life. The usual tradition how it was was the Filipinos migrate to America to get work here, but it seems opposite where we were born in America, going back to the Philippines to find work there. He wanted us to, you know, not forget where he's from and who we are, being Filipino-Americans here in Hawaii, and also to give back to his province and not forget. What does it mean to be Filipino-American? The answer may develop and change with history. But celebrations like the Filipino Centennial of Immigration to Hawaii help people remember and honor their past examine their present, and plan a brighter future. The theme that was developed by the Commission is Filipinos in Hawaii, 100 years and beyond. Um, really, I, th I think, I believe, speaks to that saying, where we've been, where we are today, and where we want to be, where we, where we hope to be in the coming years. In preparation for the Filipinos' 100-year anniversary in Hawaii, the state legislature established the Filipino Centennial Celebration Commission in 2002. In true Filipino spirit, it was fiesta time. Well, singing for the Filipino Centennial opening over at the convention center was, was an overwhelming experience. I was very honored to be a part of that, that ceremony. I sang Celebration, and I think Celebration sort of summed up, you know, the entire meaning of, you know, the 100th centennial of all these, you know, cicadas coming here to Hawaii and sort of paving the way for our generation. Later that evening, 1,200 people attended the gala dinner, which also honored the lives of 10 living cicada on Oahu. On Maui, a walk from Pu'unene Mill to the old Lahaina sugar mill commemorated the cicada plantation life of yesteryear. Uh, this is one way to honor them uh, and to uh, give them uh, all, of the, uh, all of the honor that they deserve, uh, uh, who paved the way for, for all of us. We're doing this for our grandpa, because he's a cicada. Puhai, my puhai! But we had a really great time raising cultural awareness, so this is my husband and... Yeah. Even though I'm not Filipino, I'm honored to <laughs> be part of this celebration and take part for my wife and for my wife's family. I did the leg from Spreckelsville to Hanson Road and it was nice because I was able to do it with my mom. And I'm doing this for my family. My grandpa is one of, um, one of the cicadas and so it's nice to be able to do this and honor him, not only him but all the other people who um, were able to come here and start a life and make a better life for their family. Uh, making that, uh, uh, that, that walk in the heat, we kind of experienced just a little bit of a centella of what they might have experienced in those years working in the cane fields. Also, at Maui's Barrio Fiesta, a visiting group of University of Michigan students performed a Filipino folk song. pronunciations right but we started singing just around town at a few different places and we saw that it really meant a lot to people. 
The students, hosted by Maui Land and Pineapple Company, are part of a cultural program to acquire first-hand plantation cicada experiences. I really do admire the cicadas for all they've done, for their hard work, and they've, they've lived a lot more history than I can imagine. Planting pineapple today was a lot more difficult than I thought it was. I learned a lot and gained a lot of respect for the plantation workers of today and of old. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother traveled to Mountain View Plantation on a big island to work in the sugarcane field and to work in pineapple, and um, that's where a lot of my family is, is from. But the Filipinos played a very important role in our development of our pineapple industry. Clearly, if without for them, we wouldn't have an industry today. Lanai's Filipino community held a parade honoring its living cicada and the contributions Filipino laborers have made in the pineapple plantations of yesteryear. Right now it is 90% Filipinos here on Lanai, and all of them here are derived from the cicadas. Hundreds turned out for the Molokai Filipino Centennial Celebration on August 12th. The intimate community kicked it off Molokai style with a parade. While some cicadas walked, others decided a mule-driven wagon was a better way to travel. Program festivities were held at the Mitchell Paoli Center. The living cicadas of Molokai were honored and thanked for their contributions. On Kauai, the Filipino community has had many centennial celebrations. One event helped to bring closure to the violent death of 16 cicada in what is now known as the Hanapepe Massacre. And I feel that this, this moment, the 1924 massacre, or war, however you want to call it, shouldn't be seen as a shameful moment, but should be um, reclaimed as a proud moment in our history where workers um, dared to struggle in the face of, of complete failure. The County of Kauai and the Kauai Filipino Centennial Committee unveiled a marker and heard guest speakers and historians at Hanapepe Town Park on September 9th, 82 years to the day of the tragic incident. What do we learn from it? That life is about struggle, and that uh, we all go through that in different ways. And the men here, their legacy is not to forget that day as far as what happened, but more importantly, to carry on the good work that began when they decided we're gonna come to Hawaii for a better life. And, and I think that's a legacy everyone wants to pass on to the next generation. Dai Dai Hopkins and Lucy Sibalos, a descendant of one of the slain men, helped to unveil the marble marker. The Sibalos' family's grandfather was among those killed in the shootout. It is quite emo emotional. Um, uh, how Dad explained why his dad died and, and, and how he died, um, it's something that um, he would be proud of to have this plaque here. Well, for me, it, it, it um, brought closure, a big closure. One mystery, the Sakata's burial site, remains to be solved. One of the things uh, I hope we can do as uh, we get closer to an idea of the location is perhaps to uh, go to the site and um, have some kind of a ceremony or a blessing of the site. During the ceremony, the names of the 16 cicada were solemnly read. The once anonymous Hanapepe strikers have now been given a visible memorial, a lasting acknowledgement of their place in Hawaii Filipino history. On the Big Island, several hundred people attended the unveiling of the five-foot cicada statue carved out of the Big Island's Blue Rock by sculptor Fred Soriano and erected where the first 15 cicada went to work in 1906. The grandson of one of the original cicada, Marciano Bello, was part of the cheering crowd. I feel extremely proud to be here uh, representing the Bello family. You know, as, as long as there's Bellows here, they can come to that statue and realize that Grandpa was one of the first that arrived here. At the beginning of the centennial year, a delegation of Hawaii government leaders led a visit to the Philippines to commemorate Hawaii's centennial. 
one member of the group made a sentimental journey back to his home province for the first time since he moved to Hawaii. Well, this is my first return, 24 years, and uh, this trip actually uh, was real emotional for me because my mom just passed away, um, and she actually built a home, and she didn't wasn't able to see the end results. Eric Barsatan was born in Ilocosur. He left at the age of eight with his family to join his uncle, who was a sakada on Lanai. Barsatan was raised in the pineapple plantation community. When I went to the Philippines, I see that um, the people, you know, don't have the opportunities that we do. So for me, is coming back home, just thinking how fortunate I am. One of the highlights of the trip was a visit to Port Salomage in Cabugao, Ilocos Norte, where a commemorative statue salutes the last 6,000 laborers who boarded ships from here in 1946, the last group of Filipino laborers to be recruited by the sugar planters. It's a proud moment, not only for me, but the people of Hawaii who are Filipinos, and also the Filipinos at heart. And for me, as a local Filipino, it brings me back more to the culture, more to the soil of the Republic of the Philippines. It was indeed an honor for me to uh, help fund this statue as a major component of the uh, Sakada movement. And uh, beyond that, and most importantly, it is uh, a way to remind ourselves our responsibility to uh, prepare the future generations. Felix Befetel was one of those departing Sakada and today, the 91-year-old made an emotional journey with his wife, Crescentia, and his son, Nelson, to the place he left 60 years ago. I was, I was glad that he was able to have the opportunity to go back and uh, see where everything began. Um, I was touched by it because that's where it all began, and that's where, for us, uh, where he started to make sacrifices going to a foreign country but all, all he had was a wish and a dream. Filipino pride was built piece by piece by those who made their mark on their people and their state. In this the Filipino centennial year, we hope we've learned the lessons of their life experiences and we honor our past and look beyond to our future. They had instilled in, in us this, this adventurous spirit, this, this, um, this will to work hard and will to survive. And just based on those kinds of lessons, I mean, you give me any kind of job and I'll take it. Whatever we did, we did, we tried to do, do our best. And, and somehow it had influenced or it had changed what Hawaii is today. It's the values that they inculcated in us, the way they raised us. It's the humility they brought. And uh, for my father who valued the relationships with um, not only Filipinos, but others in the community that he, he taught me how to connect with people. You can't buy that. It has to start from you. If you don't believe in yourself and who you are, you're never gonna get anywhere, you know? And so in that way, uh, I had never really rejected who I was. I was always proud of being a Filipino. We had people that came before us and we can't forget that. And that's why the centennial is such a big celebration because it's all the people that came before us that we need to remember and we need to thank. They have become Hawaii. They are part and parcel of Hawaii. I want young Filipinos to listen to the stories of of the Sakatas and all the successful Filipinos that have done it in the past with the limited opportunities that they've had. And I want them to know that we can do it. I feel proud. I think I, think I can say, sum it in, in, in a few words. We did it. We done it. So I'm very, you know, thankful. You know, maraming salamat naman po. You know? Mahalo, Justi Agina. In this, our centennial year, we have much to cherish, much to applaud, much to nurture and cultivate as we look forward to our next century in Hawaii. To the people who came before us, to those who will come after us, to all who have welcomed Hawaii's Filipinos into your lives, mahalo and mabuhay.
This is the story of the Filipinos' first 100 years in Hawaii. There are so many tales yet to be told. Hopefully this time we've had with you has given you a glimpse of how the Filipino experience has become an integral part of the multicultural fabric of Hawaii. In order to move forward, it's important to remember our roots. The sacrifices of the Sakada allowed new generations of Hawaii Filipinos to make their mark on many areas of Hawaii society. Today, Hawaii's Filipino community is a diverse mix of newly arrived immigrants and second, third, fourth generation local born families. The Filipinos of Hawaii have come a long way, but there is still much to accomplish and much to look forward to. We thank you for taking an interest in this very special project. We wish you all mabuhay. And our fondest aloha. The Hawaii Filipino Centennial Celebration Commission would like to thank First Hawaiian Bank and all the many other sponsors for making this year-long celebration possible. Mabuhay with Aloha, the Hawaii Filipino Experience, has been proudly presented by the Alexander and Baldwin Foundation and AIG Hawaii. And brought to you in part by Stanford Car Development, Castle and Cook Homes, Hawaii, and Maui Land and Pineapple Company Incorporated. With support from the James and Abigail Campbell Family Foundation, the County of Maui Office of Economic Development, Kaiser Permanente, and the Lao Lima Council. Mabuhai with Aloha will be available as a commemorative DVD. For more information, you can email us at emmyinc at hawaii.rr.com.